There are many different ways to assess the risks that might be in your environment and the resources that are available. One common thing you can do is a business impact analysis. You need to understand what resources you have in your environment, what services that you're making available to other people and the things that are important to your organization. And then you need to think about the threats that are out there that might have an impact on those particular resources. You need to consider how likely some of these attacks might be. You need to understand that would this threat be something that would be very easy to occur? Is this something we are having spam come in every day that might be phishing us? Or are these threats very uncommon threats that might be associated with operating system vulnerabilities? Then we need to think about if a machine was attacked and brought down and there was a problem and that resource was no longer available, what is the impact to the organization? Is this something that is going to create a major issue for us? If so, perhaps we need to mitigate that with some other security devices. Maybe if we lose a particular Particular resource, maybe a mail server, perhaps in your environment, losing a mail server for a day isn't an enormous problem. Maybe in your environment, losing a mail server is a big deal. So you need to think about what the impact that will be should that particular resource no longer be available. It's sometimes very useful when you're trying to calculate risk to put it in dollar signs, to get an absolute number from it. So we want to come up with ways to quantify what type of risk we may be taking with these. We want a dollar value that we can associate with this, and that way we're able to make some business decisions based on those risks that we have. One of the ways to do this is to determine what the single loss expectancy might be if a particular resource was made unavailable. If that web server goes down, if we lose our database server, if our mail server is not available and that resources is not available for people, how much money can we expect to lose from that? And then on top of that, we need to think about what should we expect or how often should we expect that particular resource not to be available for an entire year? And what we'll do is, is find the annual loss expectancy, which is how much the single loss was multiplied by an annual rate of occurrence. How many times during a year do you expect this to happen? We'll simply multiply the number of occurrences by the amount of money we would expect to lose, and that's our dollar figure for the year. That's our annual budget that we can expect to lose. And based on that, we may decide to purchase more security devices. We may decide to change the way we're providing those services, perhaps to create some redundancy, or think about other ways that we can use to help mitigate that issue. And you also have to think about, though, the historical reference here. You have to think about how often did this occur in the past. And this is very easy for things like understanding how many times we've lost the mail server over the last year. But there's things you just can't plan very well for. If there is things like, uh, well, in this particular case, a Buffalo stampede, you're not going to go down the road of calculating an annual loss expectancy of a Buffalo stampede if you happen to be in Florida. So the, you run into these situations where sometimes you can't exactly put a dollar figure on these things because there's no reference. There's no way to determine if this is something that might have occurred in the past or that might even occur in the future. To help with some of those situations, we do more of a qualitative risk assessment where it's not really dollar figures. It's really people's opinions of how badly a particular problem might be for us. So we need to think about and interview people to get their perspective of the significance. If we lost the mail server, how would that impact you and your part of the organization? We obviously don't have dollar figures we can associate with this, but some people will do a traffic light grid or some other method to be able to view this. So here's a good example of looking at the risk factor, the impact to the organization, the annualized rate of occurrence, the cost of having controls in place, and what you might think of an overall risk. And in this case, it's a, a red, a yellow, and a green that's here, much like a traffic light. So you can understand having an untrained staff might have very little impact. It might have maybe a yellow, kind of a mid-range annualized rate of occurrence. And the cost of controls for that, not very expensive. Your overall risk probably in the yellow range. So you could take multiple risk factors and at least put them on a high-level view so that you can get a better understanding of what the risk might be. Another assessment type might be a threat assessment, where you can look at all of the resources in your environment and 
get an idea of if you're vulnerable to certain threats that might be out there. These threats may be associated with operating systems, with applications, with information coming in from the internet. There's many, many different risks to consider here. And these threats are things that are discovered all the time. There's constant vigilance you have to do because not only are we finding new threats, but even old threats that have been out there that perhaps the bad guys weren't taking advantage of suddenly become popular. And now you have to think more about your position and how you would prevent that particular threat from taking advantage of your organization. Very good example of this is in June of 2011. There were a number of Gmail accounts that were held by government of the United States employees, and they were subject to a phishing attack from where we believe is China. Now, we already knew that using web-based services was insecure. We knew that Hotmail and Yahoo Mail and Google Mail are probably not the most secure methods of communication. But unfortunately, these particular people were using Gmail to communicate with people in China. And so one of the problems that now we run into is now that this has occurred, it's a good opportunity to take a step back, do another threat assessment, and think about what we're doing for web-based mail services. Do we completely prevent people from going to those web-based mail services? Do we now educate our end users? Do we put systems in place that can, from a technology perspective, allow or disallow access to those? That is just a very common thing that you'll run into with constantly keeping track of the threats and assessing how they may be affecting your organization. This Gmail attack was a very good example of how we always have to assess the threats that are out there. And we might not think that spear phishing is something that would come after us, but it was certainly something that attacked these particular government employees and contractors. This looks like an email that came from someone we trust. So absolutely spear phishing. And it looks like something that may be related to our job. The subject line is 2010 security rationale for reducing NWs. And you can see there is a Google Mail view or download link for the attack attachment. But the reality is that this is not a Google Mail download or view button. These are actually links that take you to a separate web page that is not Google's web page that presents a Gmail login page, a very realistic looking Gmail login page that many people typed in their usernames and passwords and immediately those usernames and passwords were used by the bad guys. Just another example now of thinking about how we assess these threats. So obviously, we need to now think about the Hotmails and the Yahoo Mails and anybody using web-based web -based mail services and think about how do we allow or disallow access to these types of systems. Because obviously, there are threats here that we have to consider and go into our overall assessment of threats that we have in our environment. And of course, we can be proactive with these things as well. We could do vulnerability assessments. We could scan our entire network ourselves. We can look at all of our systems, look for known vulnerabilities, try to identify problems with configurations or processes. These is a way to at least find things that are well known. If you're looking for something that is an unknown vulnerability, you may want to try different systems that are able to do fuzzing or input validation to see if you can find some of your internal systems that might have vulnerabilities that perhaps nobody has found yet. These types of vulnerability assessments can find the obvious problems. They can also find the not so obvious problems, especially if you have a large number of systems, a large number of operating systems, a large number of applications. They may all have different vulnerabilities associated with them. So this is a nice automated way to find perhaps a system that does not have the latest patches, a system that maybe does not have antivirus or anti-spyware installed, or perhaps they don't have the latest signatures. And of course, that's extremely important in antivirus virus and anti-spyware. You can also find systems that might have weak passwords. And that's one of the things I found when I scanned my network is I found a number of systems out there. I found a number of high critical vulnerabilities, some medium and some low vulnerabilities as well. And being able to take these automated systems, we can set them up, we can let them run. And then after they're finished, examine the results that we got and perhaps work towards making all of these systems and all of these resources just a little bit more secure.